Chapter 1. Working with Angels. In these last days that we are living in before the Lord returns, God desires his people to reap a great harvest of souls, and the angels have a large part to play as all of heaven teams up for this global event. Many Christians have no idea that God actually expects them to work with the angels to fulfill his plan on earth. God expected Moses to work together with the angel that was assigned to him. See, I am sending an angel ahead of you to guard you along the way and to bring you to the place I have prepared. Pay attention to him and listen to what he says. Do not rebel against him. He will not forgive your rebellion, since my name is in him. If you listen carefully to what he says and do all that I say, I will be an enemy to your enemies and oppose those who oppose you. My angel will go ahead of you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hivites, and Jebusites, and I will wipe them out. Exodus chapter 23, verses 20 through 23, New International Version. In this case, the Lord guided the people through the angel and placed his name in the angel. The Lord revealed himself in and through the angel, which is why Jehovah demanded unconditional obedience to the angel's words of instruction. Working with the angels is also evident in the life of the prophet Elijah. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Go up and meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and ask them, Is it because there is no God in Israel that you are going off to consult Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 3, New International Version. King Ahaziah of Israel sent 50 soldiers in three separate divisions to capture Elijah. The first units and their captains were consumed by fire from heaven as they stood before Elijah in their pride and arrogance. The third unit of soldiers was spared because their captain recognized an alarming cyclical pattern that was taking place. He humbled himself and pleaded for his life and the life of his 50 men with him. Once the captain's intentions were pure and there was a renowned reverence for the God of Israel, the angel of the Lord again spoke to Elijah. The angel of the Lord said to Elijah, Go down with him. Do not be afraid of him. So Elijah got up and went down with him to the king. 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 15, New International Version. Sometimes those who are not educated about the ministry of angels try to explain away such verses by saying, That's only for those living in the Old Testament. It only applies to the Jews. Yet the book of Acts is in the New Testament, and the Apostle Paul had a great working relationship with his ministry angel who saved the lives of over 200 men. After the men had gone a long way without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. But I urge you to keep up your courage, because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God whose I am and who I serve stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men. For I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Acts chapter 27, verses 21 through 25, New International Version. Notice that Paul said an angel stood by him and gave him a message that brought great comfort. Paul had faith in the angel's words because he knew the angel was sent from God. God is still sending angels today to bring vital information of peace and deliverance to the hearer. The reason we do not see more of this kind of activity taking place is because many of God's people are not open to receiving this type of ministry. Seeing Angels I'll never forget my first experience with someone who valued the ministry of angels. The year was 1992, and I was sitting in the third row of a large church in Lubbock, Texas. It was a beautiful Sunday morning, and I had arrived at the church early to get a good seat up front. Although I was raised in church, it had only been one year since I had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and I was really enjoying going to a church that taught the full gospel message. While waiting for the service to begin, I was surprised when a woman I didn't even know turned around from the row in front of me and said, There are angels sitting up in the ceiling on the rafters, and I can see them. Having made that statement, she turned back around and kept staring up toward the ceiling of the sanctuary. Although this woman, who was in her mid-forties, was well-dressed and seemed very stately in her etiquette, her comment threw me off a bit. My first thought was, this woman must be a real fruitcake. Well, as soon as that thought entered my mind, she turned right back around, held out her hand to me and said, here, God told me to give this to you. She placed a $20 bill in my hand and then turned around just as the pastor was stepping behind the pulpit to begin the service. After the opening prayer, 
the church began a time of praise and worship, and everyone was having a great time except for me. In my heart, I felt so convicted for having judged this woman. Earlier that morning, as I drove to church, I was actually wondering how I was going to be able to eat lunch after the service. I was still a few days away from my next payday at work and had run out of money. It dawned on me that because this woman had been sensitive to the Holy Spirit to obey his divine leading through handing me money at a much needed time, then it was most probable to assume that she was also telling the truth about having seen angels in the church. As time went by, several leaders in the church told me that the woman sitting in front of me that day was known to spend much time in prayer and was considered to be one of the finest Christians in the church. I repented of my sin of pride and presumption and made a commitment to learn more about what God revealed in His Word concerning His holy angels. One thing is for sure. If we honor the Word of God concerning the ministry of angels, then it causes an elevated level of angelic activity to take place in our lives. God will not intrude in areas where He is not welcomed or invited. If someone disrespects the ministry of angels, then they can expect very little, if any, angelic intervention to take place towards them. It's the same way with all ministries defined in the Bible. If someone thinks that divine healing is a joke and makes fun of preachers who have healing ministries, they are left to tough it out through the limitations of medical science. God loves to heal the sick, but a person has to have faith in Jesus as their healer in order to receive divine healing and respect his anointed ministers. Let us open our hearts more fully to all that Jesus has made available to us through his angels. Working with the angels is much like a basketball game. In basketball, everyone on the team needs to be involved. Angels are not slaves who can be bossed around or demanded to do certain things. In the coming chapters, some practical ways will be examined that allow us to biblically work in harmony with the angels assigned to us. You are on a team whether you know it or not. You are not capable nor are you expected to win the game all by yourself. It's time to get the angels off the bench and get them into the game with you. However, to work with angels requires spiritual maturity. The following chapters were not written for the lazy Christian who misplaced his Bible three weeks ago and still doesn't even know it's missing. This book was written as a mandate from God to stir up his end-time champions who will experience some of the greatest exploits ever seen in the history of the world. It requires the utmost discipline, total commitment, and a deep burning passion to walk as closely to God as possible.